Good evening, and welcome to Unenclosed Spaces in the Great Outdoors for Grounding. You are listening to a radio program on the arts in times of climate crisis, curated and hosted by David Weber-Krebs, that's me, and Jeroen Peters. We are speaking to you from the Kai Studios in Brussels. We live in an age in which human activity has a profound impact on our physical and ecological surroundings. How can we create stories, aesthetics and spaces of experience to deal with this situation reflexively and critically? What role can the performing arts play in the debate on climate crisis? Each edition of On Enclosed Spaces in the Great Outdoors has a specific focus. Today's heading is grounding. What remains of the theater as we know it when its walls crumble and the outside world creeps in? Imagine a roaming community of makers, researchers, spectators and citizens. Where can we find a ground to land? When formulating these questions over a year ago, little did we know they would be overtaken by reality in unexpected ways. The COVID-19 pandemic has made some uncanny aspects of the climate crisis into an acutely felt reality. Events, life forms and entanglements beyond our control have entered not only the theater, but also our familiar environments of life and work. Confusion, constraint, vulnerability and grief have mingled with emergent ecosystems, with the prospects of organizing our ways of living and working differently, with our awareness of privilege and so on. Even till a year ago, we could consider the theater as a rehearsal space for future scenarios, for practicing alternative ways of gathering and presenting ourselves. During the COVID-19 pandemic and the measures it inflicted, this notion received a reality check and was seriously challenged. Initially intended as a performance conference, on enclosed spaces in the great outdoors would have happened in April last year at the Kai Studios in Brussels with a live audience. The title Grounding and our questions have remained the same. Yet, in dialogue with several guests, we've reworked some of the planned contributions so they could be presented as a radio conference broadcast over three consecutive nights from the Kai Studios in Brussels. Where can we find a ground to land? Each night, we present two contributions by artists who propose their answer to this question. Where can we find the ground to land? What connects today's contributions in answer to this question are two things. A broader reflection on climate grief is in each case approached through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has made us aware of many invisibilities, absences and entanglements. Today, many of us find themselves confined to their home environments rather than in, say, a theater. However, how to address these matters collectively is central to Sigma Zacharias' Animate Realities, a binaural listening session followed by a group conversation. That's for later. But first we have a lecture by the writer Daisy Hildyard, who wrote the book The Second Body a few years ago, which is a fascinating essay on the multiple bodies we inhabit, but not quite at the same time. Beyond our local physical bodies, in these times of climate crisis, we have entanglements all over the globe, often beyond what we can sense or imagine. Last year, Hildyard spoke at unenclosed spaces and the great outdoors in Amsterdam about death, grief and extinction in an interspecies perspective. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, she reworked these thoughts in a podcast for Emergence magazine, which we're happy to present to you tonight. The lecture is titled Negative Love. Now is a time to think negatively. At some point in the last year, two viruses were coexisting inside one animal's body. Listener, they got together. A novel virus was formed, scientists currently propose, inside a pangolin's body from a reservoir in a rhinolophus bat. This virus, a chimera, was able to cross species boundaries. In late 2019, it began to communicate itself through human bodies. As the spread of the virus through the human population gained momentum, people from many different parts of the planet 
gained a new sensitivity to previously unnoticed worlds. These were the worlds of negative space, the spaces between subjects, worlds which had been invisible, transparent, or simply overlooked. A sneeze disperses around the room in a pearly cloud. Populations of millions are hosted on a fingertip. Body warmth from another person's hand leaks only slowly out of a coin or a door handle. Phenomena that lie beyond the faculties of human perception have become the subjects of widespread, mainstream public health campaigns attempting to make human minds alert to those minuscule living beings who occupy the negative zone between skin and air. Germs and viruses, like radioactivity, are imaged as a pool of neon green, the most natural colour in its most lurid tone. It feels uneasy, expressive of a longing to escape the fact that viruses and respirators, like nuclear reactors, are a part of our natural world. It's time to think negatively too, because there is no avoiding death. If you are one of the fortunate people not at risk of death from COVID-19, you will have a heightened awareness of the inside-out power of your own negative acts, the outings you don't go on, the meetings you do not attend, and that these not-done things will, in turn, imprint the shape of your life on other lives. Your choices and necessities are revealed in relief, in their effects on the other people who you do not touch, meet, pass, travel beside, work with, sell to, purchase from, or care for. The consequences of the virus, which breach boundaries at every scale, from the intracellular to the global, leave even the most positive thinkers struggling for air. A negative thinker, though, might find a new interspecies space. I had, for some time, been thinking about deaths when the virus started making its presence felt, and it drew my attention to the practical uses of looking negatively. I am, I felt, badly in need of new ways of relating. But thinking about relationships is difficult. I don't want to think only from my own perspective, because that would become narcissistic and, swiftly, boring. On the other hand, I do not want to project or imagine the experiences of others when I have not earned the knowledge of those experiences. The new negative awareness makes me wonder whether it might be possible to see new stories in our relationships, stories in which a subject is comprised of its interactions with others, and those others have force. This was made apparent to me as I read about the rising prevalence of zoonotic diseases, diseases which jump between species, as a result of widespread, large-scale human behaviours like industrial farming and habitat destruction. The negative zone which I had recently become hyper-aware of, the spaces between things, the points of connection, could offer new ground for noticing or listening to other ways of being. I wondered whether it would be possible to make any sense of these interactions as a felt presence in absence. To feel interconnection in conditions of unprecedented, enforced solitude. It seems logical in the negative space created by this disease, which has acquired the ability to cross species boundaries, to examine the conditions of interspecies lifeways by looking at interspecies deaths. There is a large ash tree in my local park, which is still alive. It's tall and thick-trunked. It's planted in the grass, with roots so substantial they make waves in the tarmac on the nearby path. Some hippies have carved into the trunk a sun with a face. The tree is so large and so apparently vital that I find it hard to believe that it will die, but one day it certainly will, and that day is likely to come soon. The fungal disease known as ash dieback is predicted to kill 99% of ash trees in Europe. This specific tree is likely to become a constituent subject of this voracious and spreading death. When I first read about ash dieback in the newspaper, I thought about this tree. 
I wondered whether it had already contracted the disease, and I was concerned as I read about the slow and that first invisible spread of symptoms, about the experience of sickening and dying. The next time I walked past my ash tree, though, looking at the smiling sun on its trunk and the black buds shaped like hooves that were pushing out of its smallest twigs, I felt that it probably wasn't hugely concerned with feelings. I could never, of course, learn what it would feel like to be an ash tree. I borrowed a couple of books about ash trees, but something was missing. I realised that I was relatively ignorant about the actuality of mortal illness, and that, rather than fantasising about this experience within an ash tree, I might also listen to an account of this particular experience in a body that was not a tree. I contacted a local hospice in which a close friend's mother had recently died. Sometime later, I received an email from a Dr. Kaur, who asked politely about the nature of my inquiry. I explained to Dr. Kaur that I was interested to hear a perspective on extinction from somebody who was no longer personally invested in survival. Dr. Kaur put me in touch with a woman called Anne, who had been diagnosed with breast cancer in her 30s and was now, in her 50s, living with brain cancer. Anne and I sat in a small side room at the hospice, which was much like a doctor's consulting room, though the chairs were more comfortable. I was nervous, but from the outset, Anne was happy to talk to me because, as she told me, she felt at peace with the concept of human extinction. Though she wasn't particularly engaged with narratives of climate emergency and extinction, she noted that mass extinctions had happened before, and she had come to terms with the fact of death. When I asked her about her individual experience, she said that the thought of death made her feel sad because of her children. Her children were adults, but you always need your mum, don't you, she said. So she saw her life as something which was formed and had meaning in relation to other lives. On the way out of the hospice, I had a conversation with Dr. Kaur. He was a religious man and spoke beautifully about the composure and fulfilment that can come about at the end of life. There is a type of sunflower that will bloom only in the desert, he told me. But he also described the moment of death as shocking and traumatic. While he was talking about this, he mentioned that the Greek term for good death is euthanasia. I asked him his feelings on euthanasia, and he was non-committal, but made an interesting comparison. Humans experience pain in dying that we wouldn't allow another animal to suffer. I say that this comparison is interesting. What's interesting to me about it, in a way, is that it's so predictable. It would seem to me almost inevitable to compare human euthanasia with putting an animal down, because they share this narrative that a good death can be a solution to suffering. The comparison is not anthropomorphism exactly. It isn't about projecting human characteristics onto animal lives. It involves a more complicated process of identification and imagination. A bewildering and unknowable aspect of human life is given ground in this experience, which is a reality for non-human animals. And when a vet puts down an animal, the grounds for doing so call on a reasonable projection of the suffering that the human believes the animal to be experiencing. Dr. Cole was navigating across species boundaries to help us both make sense of what it might be to live a good death. He used differences between species to draw attention to similarities. The boundaries between species poke up, becoming apparent when a disease acquires a new ability to communicate itself across them, and so, like language, they are most noticeable when broken. But passages through these boundaries are always at hand, in an ordinary way, at the critical moments, in the hospice or the veterinary mortuary. The fact that Anne felt sad about her own absence when she thought about her children is also interesting to me because it is unsurprising. I would guess that many human beings, if facing the prospect of death as Anne had, 
would find themselves thinking of not only the absence itself, but also the way that absence would make itself felt in other people's lives. These experiences of death, then, from the perspective of the doctor or the patient, have some negative sense of what it is to live, though they are thinking and talking in different contexts, in different ways, They see the critical experiences of life via its constitutive others. They suggest to me that the concept of a life as something which is characterised by its relationships, something emergent, is already available to human thought. This is the case even if our interconnectivity makes itself felt only during a disaster, like a radiation leak or pandemic, during which the agency of non-human beings becomes suddenly and terribly obvious, not only in the fact of its existence, but also in the fact that it is often beyond the capacity of the human sense to detect it. And yet, in ordinary life, outside the disaster zone, these interrelationships are often denied. I deny them conceptually when I think of myself as an individual. I deny them practically when I use pesticides that sicken those they are designed to convenience. I wonder whether this human habit of denying interrelationships is in fact a consequence of interconnection, a need to separate oneself from affinities or responsibilities, which would be painful. Anne had mentioned that she'd struggled to be heard by her doctors, family and colleagues. She was a middle-aged woman who had worked in a supermarket before she became ill and she described herself as unassertive. She struggled to get a diagnosis or proper treatment. I was struck by the connection between these factors as it came up several times, and I asked her how others might have done things differently. Anne responded with practical, physical advice, and what she described sounded to me like a process of attunement. She said, adapt yourself to the patient physically. Make contact be polite, even if they have debilitating physical symptoms. She compared this attunement to speaking with children, the way you might bend down to the child's level or be more tactile if they can't yet talk. And even if you don't have much to say to a person, you can still listen or make some gentle physical contact. That seemed to strike her as especially important as it came out, and she said it again more emphatically. Listening, she said is a massive thing. A few years ago, one autumn, I was visiting my parents on their farm and there were two young female cows in the small field in front of the house. The heifers were only a few months old, being kept in this small field because the bull was with the other cows. My father did not want these two to carry a calf that year because he thought they were too fragile. The heifers trotted over when we appeared in the garden on the day I arrived and my daughter, who was a baby then, tried to stroke them. They were cute, their hides still clean white, long eyelashes, nosy. The next morning one of the young cows was lying dead in the field, and her cousin was standing beside her, head down. The corpse was bloated. She had seemed healthy, so it was a mystery and worrying. Just above the field she was in, there was a small yew tree that had recently been clipped. Yew trees are poisonous. In England, they are traditionally planted in graveyards to deter cattle or sheep from wandering on the graves. In gardens, there is a centuries-long history of yew to pyre, in which the shrubs are transformed with shears into smooth green walls, pyramids, marbles or birds. Today, pharmaceutical companies pay per kilogram of clippings because there is a compound in the young green shoots that can be used in certain chemotherapy treatments. So the yew tree is a critical cure for some people, but it is also poisonous to cows. That day, at the farm, we thought that the poisonous clippings might have fallen below the wall when the garden hedge was trimmed, and this was what might have killed her. I looked up yew poisoning on my phone to try to establish whether her corpse suggested yew poisoning. I found myself plunged, however, not into veterinary science, but into an online forum in which suicidal people debated the pros and cons of using you to poison oneself. 
Suicide by You was, among the anonymized voices of the forum, found to be an interesting, if niche, method. But there was some concern that the poison might make the corpse swell up and look ugly and purple. I closed my browser and put the phone down. I had a certain new insight into a human world I hadn't known before, but I wasn't much wiser about cows. A post-mortem would be prohibitively expensive. The cow, of course, could not go into the food chain. My father told me that the cow would receive a rudimentary examination at what is called the knacker's yard, which has a licence to dispose of dead farm animals. The knacker's yard produces household goods, like leather or glue, out of the dead bodies. The people who work in the knacker's yard, who are not vets, have a certain practical and experiential knowledge. They will open her up and have a look, my father told me. When this young cow's stomach was opened a few days later, he sent me a text to say that it was not full of you, that she might have died of a common disease known as bloat. My encounters with Anne and Dr. Kaur at the hospice had given me an intimation of the way a life's relationships might be revealed in the process of dying. The cow's story turns this intimation towards something more specific and bigger. Her death exposes, in relief, ways of life across species. The three life forms, human, you, cow, are intertwined. They literally move through one another's bodies in relationships which mean life and death to one another. The human trims the yew tree and the cow consumes yew clippings. The human eats beef and the yew is planted in graveyards where its roots feed on human corpses and its presence deters cattle. The yew tree cures cancer patients and farmers give the cow food, bedding and medicine. This is a negative vision of life, not only in the bleak and perhaps comic sense that it is a vision of life seen through a lens of death, but also in the sense that it is a life shown through others. It is a life revealed in relief by looking away from the individual self. It makes the human look small, provincial, off-centre. I started to see how even those relationships like farming or gardening, in which the human poses as the controlling force, extend beyond human order or control. This decentering is experienced as a catastrophe when a virus overturns all human orders and arrangements. But it runs through everything, everywhere, all the time. Ash dieback is caused by a minute white fungus, which over a decade or more spread stealthily inside commercial shipments of ash trees until it became catastrophic for the tree across counties, landscapes and continents. The late naturalist Roger Deakin, writing about ash trees, has said that an ash tree will sometimes send out its branches in florid, baroque spirals for no apparent reason except exuberance. This is classic anthropomorphism. Nonetheless, I love how Deakin acknowledges that he does not know the why of what the tree is doing. His image of exuberance, each living individual as a host of other life forms, returned to me as I read the ecologist Oliver Rackham's natural history, The Ash Tree. It was the sheer number of other life forms that had written their life ways on, within and through the ash, in life and in death. Many birds build their nests in ash trees. Deer like to browse on the youngest shoots of ash trees in early spring. In winter, when food is scarce, rabbits and hares eat the bark. There are 111 types of insect or mite which depend on the ash tree, of which 29 are specific to ash. There are 26 mosses and 4 liverworts. There is a type of fungus known as King Alfred's cake, the centre-barred salad moth, the dusky thorn moth. Earthworms have a taste for ash leaves, which they draw into the hummus before fungi can compost it. As tree lichens decline in increasingly contaminated air, the ash is the last refuge for many species. When I went back to my ash tree in the park, I noticed the magpies fighting in its branches 
the children arguing near the base, the long-gone hippies who had committed their artwork on its trunk, the half-built nest in the topmost twigs, the sock of mosses around the base, and the pale green, grey and yellow tracings of lichen all across its surface. There was more going on, beyond what I could see. If the yew tree and the cow, the cow and the human, showed me basic interactions between species, then the ash tree provided an exuberant flourishing without the human at the centre. The ash tree was a living thing, but the more I looked at it, the more I saw it as a place, a habitat as well as an individual, bearing the traces of other lives and tracing its own life through them. This is not to say that these are all the traces of collaboration. Some of these species are mutually beneficial, but others harm or even kill ash trees, not least the new fungus. Ash dieback will expose and change the lives of these interdependent species as the ash is all but wiped out. Its spread has been enabled by the global circulation of wood and live trees. In his conclusion to the ash tree, Rackham asks what can be done about this kind of catastrophe. Ash dieback, like those zoonotic diseases that threaten the human, was fueled by human, capitalist and extractive processes. Rackham is blunt on this. People need to get real. Stop letting the anthropology of commerce overrule the practical world. A million exported, container-grown trees carry with their roots a thousand tonnes of soil. However thoroughly the customs, or, Rackham says, a responsible nurseryman, inspect the consignment, they cannot detect a microscopic pathogen when they do not know, in advance, what to look for. I like the way Rackham inverts the habitual logic of economy and environment, wherein environmentalists are told that their hopes are not realistic. In his version, the mass extraction and circulation of living things comes to appear impractical. What is described in arriving at this reversal is a negative perception, a perception of what humans cannot perceive the living world going beyond us, and Rackham suggests that it is practically possible to accept and allow for this excess. This would mean taking negative action, that is, not doing something, in this case, importing trees on a mass scale. All the relationships I have described in this negative essay are unfair. It was difficult for Anne to persuade others to take her seriously as a middle-aged, working-class woman. The young cow didn't get a full post-mortem because it wasn't considered valuable enough to humans. If it had been a racehorse, in contrast, its post-mortem might have been more expensive than those received by many humans. And trees and soil, like many other living things, are compelled to flow on a huge scale from poorer to wealthier countries. These inequalities range across scales and species. There are individual stories and there are global phenomena. They show how deaths are not, as convention would have it, the end of a story, but are in fact moments in a larger network of stories. They're moments of emergence in disappearance or negative emergence. For me, the stories are the thing here. The stories concentrate much more than I can draw out of them as conclusion or thought. But I have been trying to draw attention to the ways in which the individual cow, human or tree, in the process of becoming absent, exposes the imprints of its constitutive others in specific and different ways. That is, each death exposes other life ways because those life ways will be changed by its absence. It exposes the relationships between the cow and the plant that grows near it, between the ash tree in a shipping container and the microbes that cling to its roots, between a woman who works in a supermarket 
and the cells inside her own body. Anne emphasised the importance of careful attention or listening. The heightened awareness of negative space that has come out of the COVID-19 crisis has drawn conscious attention to these connections and the fact that it is all but impossible for the human mind to take them all in. How many things have you been within a two-metre radius of today? How many times have you touched your face? Of course, it's easy to talk about listening, attunement or love for the other. By looking at specific stories, I'm trying to get at how these ideas bear out in active form. Spending time with the dying suggests to me that when we are thinking about how or where to find ground in these weird and unstable times, it would be practically useful to have a stronger sense of a life's negatives as the essential foothold for every existence. I was impressed by the way Anne had come to terms with her own non-existence and this, it seemed to me, enabled her to think clearly and generously about the terms on which she was alive. It is often imagined that ecological virtue will emerge naturally from a debt to future life. We're told to recycle for the sake of our grandchildren on the principle that they embody a version of ourselves that will be around for a long time. Perhaps it would be an interesting thought experiment to refocus this to an attention to our own future non-existence. Tell yourself to recycle because you are going to be not around for a long time. It might be possible to discover in this not nihilism, what's the point of doing anything if I'm not there, but an increased belief in the value of the other beings whose conditions are entangled in our own life ways. Any ecological morality must involve the kind of negative acts that COVID-19 has made familiar to many people in the world. Not travelling, not extracting, not consuming. This negative action, which ecological activists have been calling for for years, has become a feature of daily life in the richest countries in the world, with a speed that is shocking to anybody who has experienced the powerful resistance to these changes, most significantly in her government, but also in herself. There have been upheavals in the way people are living around the globe, involving massive renovations of life and society. All this exposes the reality that the richest countries are quite able to make these changes happen. They can see negative space. They know how to legislate for interconnection. They are more than able to compel those practical forms of care for one's others that reveal themselves like negative love. So now we are going to listen to the work of Sigmar Zacharias. We, are, we have been talking with Sigma for a long time now. We are happy to present to you a new work, created during the lockdown. Sigma researches and actualizes the grief present in these times. Personal grief and collective grief. Grief for the dead, grief for the climate, grief for social injustices, grief for a certain idea of future, individual, collective, worldly and planetary grief. Grief for the lack of touch. Animaterialities, or animaterialities, consists in a soma acoustic listening session and a group conversation right after this listening session. Some of the participants to this edition of On Enclosed Spaces and the Great Outdoors Daisy Hildyard, Ingrid Franken, Anne-Lise Legac, Julien Bruno, and Jeroen and I have been doing the soma acoustic listening session earlier this week. And you'll be listening to our conversation with Sigmar right after listening to it yourself now. But first, I give the word to Sigmar for a short introduction. Oh, thank you, David. That's very kind. And thank you very much for being here with me today, with us. 
um, what you out there can't see is that a lot of the participants of this program are actually together right now. And we're going to listen to a, um, a piece. The, the work is actually not just the listening session. I started these listening sessions because I was in New Orleans when the pandemic started and I was there to research collective practices, uh, collective public practices in grief and grieving. And then of course the pandemic started and there was neither a lot of collectivity nor pub being public together. Um, and then I realized that the, the one way of touching people would be through vibrations and sound. And I had researched a lot about the polyvagal theory and different ways to um, use vibrations to activate and synchronize people. And one of the, the, the reasons why collective public grieving for me is important uh, is that uh, grief has been privatized for so many years in capitalist systems and, um, and people, and by privatization, the, the, it, it's also kind of outsourced the reason of how, what is being uh, grieved and how people are grieving is kind of outsourced from functionality. So I'm really interested in opening up and learning from practices that are existing already um, in opening up public spaces of conversation and being together in the face of grief and with different griefs and what could it be to have uh, spaces to collectively grieve but also to grieve alone so where is the individual collective global and planetary grief and when we speak about grief I'm not only talking about um, deceased people which many of us have experienced probably but also this this time brings up so many different types of grief, be it um, environmental grief, grief because of social injustices, grief uh, for lost futures, grief for not knowing one's own perspective anymore, grief for touch. So um, I've started uh, working with this, what I call some acoustic listening sessions, and I want to invite you to uh, listen with me and listen with your whole body and then take this listening experience as a kind of shared embodied experience from which we can start our conversation. So um, what you need for this, since we can't meet in the theater, I invite you to kind of set your own frame of uh, stepping out of your normal life, which I suggest um, a hot water bottle or a blanket. I invite you to lie down while you listen, to feel, to sense your body differently, to let gravity play on your body differently. Uh, so grab a hot water bottle or a blanket or both. Grab a heavy object that can be like something really heavy, like a stone or I don't know, minerals, whatever you have that's heavy that can either fit in your hand or that you can place on your body. It can also be a very heavy book or many heavy books, depending. Um, I have an urn that my sister made that I'm going to, or an old medicine ball, whatever you have. So find a heavy object, um, hot water bottle or blanket. And a very, very important, you need headphones. You need to listen to this through headphones because it's recorded with a binaural recording method and um, it doesn't work if you don't have headphones. So while you do this and while you collect your objects and get into place, you know, think about whether you want to change the light, whether you want to switch off your phone, whatever it is. The listening session is about 37 minutes. We'll listen to it together and have a shared conversation afterwards. So I hope that I gave everybody enough space by now to collect their items. And if you're ready, we can start listening. The piece is called Anima Realities or Anima Realities. 
enjoy.
future, past, present, beyond, is your history as anima the reality. When you connect through pressure and feelings. We cannot survive without many hands holding us on the wild edge of grief. We have time for grief. This is what we are called for. in a mutual gravitational field to consent not to be a single being the al- the alchemy of loss is to feel yourself tangled in a planetary nest
you can open your eyes now. Take a second to land back in your space. And now, join us in the Zoom room. So, the second part of this work of Zygmar Zacharias is usually a talk with people who have just been listening to the work, to the first part. And earlier this week, Daisy Hildyard, Ingrid Franken, Anne-Lise Legac, Julien Bruno, and Jeroen and I We met with Sigmar on Zoom just after having had the experience of listening to Animaterialities. So this was, this is one of many works that I do under a big umbrella of the name of Training for Political Imaginaries. And then they find different formats. And maybe first I want to uh, credit and acknowledge my collaborator, Steve Heather, who, who composed these sounds that all came from my body and from my mouth. And, um, and what I forgot to say, but what kind of is something that is always there is, is the question of who or what do we bring into the space? Like who or what do we bring into this situation? And that is maybe even stronger so when we talk, when we enter spaces of grief. And then after we've spent time with them, maybe we also have to ask who or what do we let go? So that was actually the last thing I wanted to say. And then I just wanted to ask you, so what came up? What, what came up for you? What happened for you? Uh, what comments or associations, stories, questions do you have? How did it, you know, what, what space did it, What spaces and what times um, did it open up for you? Yeah, I had the impression to go through different um, landscapes um, the liquid element was very present at the beginning. Um, later on, after the the first um, the first time we hear words, after that I I was more into earth and mineral element, and uh, and clearly at the end I was with air, wind, breath. Mm. And throughout I was um, continuously connected to a sense of layering, um, sometimes more like a, a, a layering of currents, a layering of veils, a layering of strata, Yeah, I could say this for a start. Mm. Anybody else? I mean, I don't need to kind of pass on the word. I think you can just take the word and take the space, however it comes. Yeah, I can maybe say something. Um, I was really struck by the sentence don't know if I remember it correctly, but about the alchemy of grief uh, being that 
we're part of this entangled nest. What is the exact sentence again? Um, the alchemy of loss is, um, oh my God, I can't even remember. The alchemy <laughs> of loss is to make you feel entangled in a planetary nest. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was like a moment that really, where, where the space shifted for me a lot very um, significantly and and just earlier I was listening to Hildjert's um, contribution um, and then of course we've been busy with our own contribution where we're really looking at what is it to give up our humanity and become ghost to be in this to be ghost and to and to acknowledge the, the ghostly space. And yeah, why did that sentence strike me so much? Yeah, it because it, it because it really points out this what's also repeated, like, we are not alone. No, we are not even, we are more than not alone. We are not a singular entity because how otherwise would grief feel like a death in itself? Uh, our own death in itself, a, a part of us dying. Um, why is loss not just the loss of the other, but also the loss of, of myself? Mm. So for me, that was... That was really strong, and then the combination of um, of the vibrations of the sound and the vibrations of my cat purring on top of me as my heavy object. Ah, great! <laughs> Hilarious. <coughs> fantastic. So, because this purring, like I did this purring in there. Ah, oh, fantastic! Did she feel that? Did she yeah. sync with that? Huh? Did she sync with that? No, it was two different purrs. So oh, great. Purr, so it was like this kind of like, um, yeah, interesting uh, harm, harmonizing between <laughs> my cat's purring and your purring. And, and then this feeling of being under the ground somehow, of, of, of hearing the sounds from, from in a cave or in a womb or maybe in a grave. Um, and... Uh, and then all these sensations of warmth were kind of dissociating somehow with the sound. I found that really interesting also, um, that I was feeling warm, but it was as if I should not be feeling warm in this, uh, in this sonic space or in this space of death. Which is surely partly a description of grief, right? When somebody else dies and you're still warm, but they're cold. Um, you feel like maybe you shouldn't be. Mm. I found it, I thought there was a nice, quite human, dare I say, um, closeness to it. I thought it was a very pleasurable thing to listen to. Um, and I guess maybe those kind of bodily sounds certainly coming from a stranger and like right inside your earphones um, is not something that many of us have had much recently. So I thought it had a particularly powerful kind of, um, it was a particularly powerful experience in the current circumstances. Hmm. I mean, one of the one of the reasons, really, why why I why I go why I use this technology at the moment is is exactly that because what it actually does is that it physiologically touches you. It's not just the image of touch or the idea of touch. It actually the the vibrations touch you, and you have a physio physiological sensation. And the 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 quality, I think, what I'm really. Um, the other thing is that, so it's not just a one-on-one, -on -one, but the, the thing that we're all listening to it together at the same time, and we're breathing together at the same time, and we're 
Um, so one of the things that the polyvagal theory says is that you don't only have the capacity to self-regulation, not, not only your own body has the capacity of self-healing through self-regulation, but also we have the capacity to co-regulate through the presence of our bodies and through the vibrations of our bodies. And having been cut off from that is another very particular circumstance at the moment. So one of the one of the experiments is to kind of see how far can we sense co-regulation remotely as we do right now. But then, of course, these all these other um, associations with what, what what you were bringing, and I'm I'm also very curious to hear from you, Daisy, like what how that resonated with your text or where it disresonated. I would open that to other people. I'm not sure that I have a response to that. Mm. Partly because I'm afraid I haven't read my piece for a while. <laughs> I haven't done my homework. <clears throat> I mean, uh, for me, uh, not not, not uh, linking it to uh, the text of Daisy, but for me, I didn't have at all the... Um, I mean, I, in the beginning, I was very much with this anima word of the breathing, and uh, it starts with the breathing. It's also, it also ends with the breathing. So I was very, very much with that word. But then when that stopped, for me, all the sounds I was hearing, I could not... Uh, relate them at all to anything I know. And so I was very much busy with grief, but I was actually more busy with death. I was I was actually thinking, okay, this is not grief. This is actually somehow the... Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the experience of death that you are proposing. Or well, this is how I was... Uh, I was uh, I was kind of experiencing it. And then I was, yeah, I was thinking of, oh, yeah, maybe that is grief. Like when, because grief, usually you think of, oh, yeah, someone, like Daisy said, someone, someone leaves and you stay somehow. But maybe when someone leaves, you don't stay, you, you enter in something that you don't know. And, uh, and the entire experience for me was was a was an experience of the unknown, and I was not at all. I mean, I didn't know at all that you were that it was produced by the human body. So I thought it was really acousmatic sounds. Um, yeah, I mean, and I was really wondering why it, why it, why it is a circle, why it, why it comes back to to the anima, to the breathing. I mean, for me, the, the uh, processes of grief and death and dying are very, very interrelated. I mean, I've, um, I have a personal experience with it through my um, sister's death and dying that I accompanied very closely. And then the, the, the process of dying itself also. And then of course the grief that I wasn't prepared for. I had a very beautiful, like mean, we learned together to die together, but the grieving part I had to do by myself, which was very different and a very different experience. But what happened in the death and dying with my sister was that I learned the anticipatory grief of grieving the fact that she's dying together while she is alive and learning how this grief is changing our relationship already. So the process of death and dying and the process of grieving are m much more interrelated than they are. It's not a linear timeline that you go first this sequence, then that sequence, then that sequence, then that sequence. And for example, in relation to climate grief, uh, we are in, we're experiencing heavy anticipatory grief. You could also say we're experiencing the process of dying simultaneously to anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. So I think the processes are super, super similar. Um, I've also started a training as a death doula and the, the 
the, these kind of who who is accompanied when and for what is they're very very blurry one thing that they all share is exactly the relation to the unknown and the relation to the intimacy with the unknown and because that is something that is present simultaneously um and because of that i mean for me that is really a a kind of uh simultaneous Uh, intimacy and alienation at the same time and that that how to how to have these spaces and hold them for each other also because there's no fixing it's just like holding it for each other and how to start and this is why these conversations for me are important are and they're part of the performance so to speak is like how can we start having words for it so that we don't have to compartmentalize and and put it away until we have a solution because with personal grief as well as with bigger spheres of grief be it climate grief or grief because of social injustices we don't have a quick solution we have to learn to live with grief rather than overcome it or we learn to live in the dying process rather than overcome it and so what are possibilities what are places where performance can provide some of this grief work that for me is the is the incentive and the more intimate and sensual and um embodied it can be the better because it is a corporeal process and it's not just a human corporeal process but it is this material animate material process and i mean the beautiful it's a it's a word game that i took from fred montan actually he talks about animate materialities and then you can play this with an any materiality or an immateriality or any matter reality so okay. there is like there's plenty of game um to be had with this um but what for me it's really a corporeal um process and 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 um and maybe that's why i mean corporeal is problematic because it still stays with the living shape but how to kind of like wh- what is the sensing of it rather than the knowing of it or the recognizing of it for me it was definitely a bodily experience and um and i was as i was traveling through it um uh, it uh, it made me aware of my own cavities in the body and um and also i i sometimes i i felt like um producing voice myself because i wanted to participate with uh inner vibration to the vibration i was hearing mm. which i did only uh partially because uh i'm at home and uh, my home is not well isolated for sound so i had to stay uh, at a certain level but like once in a while i would i would hum together or produce sound because uh, these cavities that were um awakened by the by the listening wanted also to to vibrate and, and yeah and overall i could say also that the 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 soundtrack felt like a massage I really felt like after, at the end of it that I went through massage. Mm. I think I experienced something similar in that it it was as I say it's kind of a nice and a pleasurable sound for me and my experience of all of the different kind of articulations or noises that came across with it they were quite soothing I guess. Um even the sounds that were more obviously grief stricken at the end but sigma when you talk about it it makes me wonder whether when you talk about intimacy and alienation whether you were actually trying to create an experience of grief that 
this experience of the body, but necessarily always disembodied. There's a sense of closeness, but it's not real in the sense that there aren't two bodies together. Were you trying to actually induce or perform an experience of grief in that separation? Or were you perhaps doing something that was intended more to kind of, I guess, heal over or, or soothe an experience of grief? I think both. I think, I mean, the, the, I, I was intentionally working a lot with vibration. Um, all, the, all the frequencies that you heard, all the humming that you heard were frequencies that are, uh, are very specific frequencies that are uh, synced with the frequencies of the heart, the root chakra and the lungs. So, because every organ has a different frequency and all of this knowledge is known from very, very ancient uh, healing methods as well as war technology. So, you know, depending on <laughs> which way you want to take it, the knowledge is there. And the, so I was working with frequencies that open up the, um, open up the root chakra, the heart chakra and uh, the frequency of the lung uh, specifically also one that addresses the um, resolution of fear and for me that is um, that is important because it is mostly the fear of the unknown that I think is is kind of generative behind a lot of things um, so on the one hand I I was um, and I work a lot with with really researching the the polyvagal theory of the vagus nerve in relation to sonic interventions. Um, so like calibrating the nervous system and how it, so this is also one thing that I want to say if people, because not everybody experiences this as soothing at all. Um, I've had other reactions. So if people feel the pain in their ears, you can be assured that it's not hurting your eardrums at all. Uh, also, the volume on the thing is in a way that you can't push it higher. What you feel is the muscles that hold the eardrum in place. And because the eardrum is nerved and the frequency that it might not be used to very often, it wasn't too high, it wasn't too low. It's basically the mid-range that is getting lost. Um, but it actually is almost like a little muscle pain in your ear. That's so that just in case pe some people feel that different people have experienced it differently. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it's really one of the things that the experience of grief does is the kind of disembodied, very embodiment. And part of the disembodiment is that I experience my body in ways that I'm not used to or that, or that I don't recognize, which... As soon as you do that, as, and this is the, the, the amazing thing of the biofeedback loop that becomes a neurological and the psychological feedback loop and a sociological feedback loop, is that if you experience your body otherwise, you experience the outside otherwise, and you might even experience time otherwise. I mean, this idea of fogginess or disconnectedness. Um, so there's people also describe a very kind of fogginess and yet super, super clear. Like some things become incredibly clear if you speak with dying people. Um, there is a fogginess and then some things are just very, very clear. Or if you speak with grieving people, that's also something. I think, so I can't say I'm not representing anything. I'm interested in the bodily experience of it. And yes, I'm working with triggers that I, um, I relate to that. So to answer your question, I think, yeah, I am I'm more interested in creating an experience of grief in order to also co-calibrate in the sense of, if I see that other people can be with this experience, it might not be that scary anymore. So part of the co-calibration is basically to be with somebody in a state when they are um, overwhelmed, let's say, and while they see that the other person is not in overwhelm and they're holding the vibrational field for them, they see that it is possible to stay to remain in that state, which is part of like how co-calibration works, basically. You can, you can bring each other down, you can bring each other to a state of endurance and resiliency. 
for and yeah with regards to the unknown the undescribable the un you know unrecognizable in particular so i'm more interested in like perception rather than recognition i think i mean i have listened to your text again and um we have we have um i think this what you're talking about negative space and it's super interesting because just recently actually i wrote a text in a writing workshop uh, led by somebody called daisy and i i actually wrote about uh, the negative space of of grief and i didn't really i hadn't realized that um you had spoken about that uh, and I find this idea of negative space um, maybe not just as the imprint of, like this is how we, how we know negative space, that which is not that which is. So the, like the non-human would be the negative space of the human. And then it becomes again kind of humanocentric. So how can we think of every, everything more than human as something other than just non-human? But uh, also what could be the negative space, like in, in what, why it's so interesting to me is that it, it carries this ring of negativity and negative emotions. And then how can it, how it is actually a, a space of possibility and of transformation. And this, I guess, brings back this, this question of like the alchemy of loss is, um, to perceive yourself entangled in a planetary nest, but also to see the transformational force and power of grief um, and not in order to kind of um, extract it in a neoliberal way for self-improvement again, but more to see, you know, what does it actually produce? What is actually there? You know, what is it that we're dealing with and how can we be with that? Yeah, it's very interesting because in, in the conversations that, that, that we've been having in the research into the ghost for the past months, this has really come up as a tension, as a point of tension. On the one hand, the potentiality of, of the ghost, the potentiality of what is absent and could have been and all of that, what we're talking about of this negative space. And at the same time, the real experience of loss and how to hold both the potential and maybe also the energy that it can bring and the, and the power it can bring to activism together with, like, with the fact that we need to fucking mourn, you know? <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and that is, uh, like, it's unresolved and maybe unresolvable to hold those two points at the same time but we kept coming back to this again and again also. I think a lot, I mean, I learned, I've been studying with um, Rezman Benakam and um, the book that he's written, My Grandmother's Hands. And um, one of the things that I think I would go answer or, or kind of think with you in that is that we don't need to resolve it. But what we do need is that we do need to develop collective practices or how he says cultures to actually hold those spaces, whether it is to, to investigate what the potential is and the possibility making and the transformational force of these um, ghosts or ontologies, but also what is it to give it up and how can you hold the space of the grief that is in that case, in his argument, involved in white supremacy and the dismantling of white supremacy um, from, from grief to shame to lost entitlement, everything, how, how can white people, people with white bodies, actually start learning to hold these spaces to not just shame each other for it, but actually acknowledge that there is a grief in different variations. So what are the different, and this is why there isn't just one thing. It's like, I think we have to 
we have to build many cultural containers to be able to hold and because they have to be specific. So, you know, grief, climate grief is very different than personal grief of a, of a dying person than giving up the idea of the future that I might have had or my children might have had. Um, they are actually very different. And to find out what, again, I come back to what is there actually, how does it play out on the body? How does it play out on social relations? Um, and what can, what kind of training, and this is why I'm calling it training for political managers, but what kind of training can uh, culture practice and performance practice uh, provide to, to, to be with it, to, to, to be, to develop these cultures and to, to, to develop a sort of uh, resiliency um, in the face of death, dying, grief. Yeah, I'm also thinking how, um, despite or together with the pain, uh, the experience of grief can be an experience of beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, which can bring the sense that it's not, I mean, this question of mourning on one side and contemplation of potentialities on the other sides are maybe could maybe more could maybe be more intimate with each other or more intertwined with each other um, and that are not maybe not always two different uh, actions or orientation for yourself or for a group but that's yeah by by welcoming the grief being intimate with your pain, there is a beauty that that uh, unfolds and open your eyes and senses and and bodies in a way that make you um, make you uh, in closer contact with potentialities, with possibilities, with newness, with other ways to to relate and to to live. I think also grief teaches you a lot in the sense of what are you reacting to? And by understanding what you're reacting to and why you're reacting in certain ways, and it's not just a, a intellectual cognitive understanding, it's really an embodied understanding. You can also acknowledge the structures that have shaped you and how much you want to re reproduce those structures and how much this is a moment to actually not re keep reproducing them. And that's where grief for me is a fantastic teacher also, because grief is a huge value catalyst. Like it's a reflection of what has value and what values you want to retain or rebuild. And th this question of what has value, who or what has value and how you can create how you can contribute to sustain these value formations. That is for me one, and that then it goes hand in hand with like, it's not either or, but it's really like, how can you learn? What does it actually disclose? And what, can, what does it make you feel closer to? Um, this kind of conscious, but also then, and therefore shared grief. That's why I think collective grief is so incredibly important because you can, uh, you you learn from each other. You learn from how um, what value because they're, they're community values, they're collective values. And in this, in the face of grief, we are called to ask collectively, what do we want to stand for? I can see. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I can see how on a pretty basic level as well. Um, when you talk about the fear of the unknown and reducing the fear of the unknown, that seems to me to be a useful sort of political tool, I guess. I mean, when you're talking about white supremacy or the resistance to all kinds of progressive activist movements, much of that emerges from fear of the unknown, right? So I think that to be able to reduce that even in a very limited context or, you know, temporarily, 
sort of deactivate it, I think it has like possibility. Mm. Mm. Yeah, in that sense, I was wondering if you ever had, had done this format for people in a theater, for example, being together in a space. When, David, when? <laughs> this piece has been first shown or heard or listened to in uh, November 2020. Okay. So it comes out of the impossibility of sharing space together. No, there is actually, I when I started thinking about it in every, because even now we're thinking of, you know, I don't think in, in the next year or so we will be sitting 500 people bum next to bum on chairs in a theater so even if we're going back into theaters I think um, I'm thinking that that we will deal with uh, social distancing so another component of this are um, sensory objects and I have worked with some of them some of them were like water bubbles or um, heavy objects that were tentacular that I made um, that the, the objects were connecting the people. So the people were lying in distance to each other. But then for example, a huge bubble of water was between two people. So whenever one person would move, the water would transport their movement to the other person. So you actually feel the movement of the other person, although you don't touch each other. And the objects, the tentacular objects are also like spreading heaviness. Um, Gravity and this is again like this heavy this heavy object is really something that is missing from touch. I mean, we know that Merkel cells really need like transport calm and that they're just sensory cells that that react to touch and to pressure. And so you know, but that pressure is needed for for the system to calm down a bit. So yeah, I think it this. The idea, of course, because I think co-regulation works very, very differently if you actually do share a space together, like a physical. Yeah, but space. for me, for me, uh, I was I was imagining uh, doing this in a theater together with social distancing, without object or anything, but only the the idea that we are together in a space would be very interesting. Because for me, there was also a very strong sense of loneliness in this in this entire thing mm. uh, but the fact that we that i know that we are doing this together and that tonight also a lot of other people did it together with us um uh adds a totally different uh, another layer to the whole mm. thing so probably if you if we could be in a theater together it it would add also that um so I'm, I'm not yeah no, absolutely, and yeah. I think it is. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm working on a whole series of these things, and they're 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 possible online, but they're also really, really possible for a shared space. Mm -hmm. And this this discrepancy between alone together for me is another real. It's it's real, like the, the to feel simultaneously alone and together, and that yeah. not one is better than the other. Um, so how can you experience this collectivity as something that you're not a single being, but you are a being that you have a certain perception of? You've been listening to the second day of On Enclosed Spaces in the Great Outdoors for Grounding. Please join us tomorrow at 8 o'clock for the third and last day with contributions by the artist and researcher Julien Bruno and Anne-Lise Legac with Loto Retina. Julien, by activating and invoking the genius Loki of the Kai Theater, will address all of us listening to him in all the different locations will be. And Anne-Lise and Loto Retina will tell us the story of Chien 23, Dog 23, meeting Liquid Virgin, the spectral figure of a group in search for happiness in a four-star spa in Croatia. I'm looking forward to this and you are very welcome to join us tomorrow at 8 o'clock. <laughs>